Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the National Opera Center. Lovely to have you here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Skorka. I'm president of Opera America, and it is a delight to welcome you to an evening that is very, very special for us, because this evening we get to salute the great Cheryl Mills on the occasion of his birthday. In, we won't say which one. Um, <laughs> when you look at the statistics, the honors, the, the numbers that added up over a career that spanned four decades, it's extraordinary. 650 performances at the Metropolitan Opera, including 10 national telecasts, 16 new productions, including seven opening nights at the Met. Cheryl's career spanned two golden ages. He uh, got to perform with people like Tibaldi, and then Caballier, and Sutherland, uh, and into the singers of our current day. Um, he is his own golden age that spanned two. He is the most recorded American opera singer in the history of recording. Uh, but Cheryl has a second career as a teacher, as a coach, as uh, a mentor to a new generation of singers who hopefully will carry on his superb vocal tradition. Uh, he founded with Maria Zuvis, his wife, Voice Experience, which is a training program that has trained hundreds, if not thousands, of young singers. More recently with Maria, they established the Savannah Voice Festival, which is a summer festival that includes opera, musical theater, and song, but also enriches the cultural life of Savannah throughout the year. All of this is part of the Cheryl Mills Voice programs, a wonderful combination of training programs and performance opportunities. But we're going to hear from the man himself. We're going to watch some excerpts of his extraordinary, incomparable performances. But first, we're going to greet him. Please join me in welcoming Cheryl Mills. <laughs> Another great ovation for, for you. Do you ever get tired hearing the ovations, the bravos, the applause? Do you get used to it? Does anyone ever get tired of, of applause? <laughs> I think not. <laughs> Although the old, the old divas used to do, please, no more. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Well, we're going to take a look at some clips first. Uh, there is... Uh, uh, an early Met broadcast when television and telecasts were really quite the rage and you uh, were a star of many of them. Uh, one of your signature roles, if not the signature role, but there are so many, uh, Iago and Verdi's Otello. So let's take a look at a okay. clip. Not bad. I think we'll call you in for a live audition. <laughs> oh, thank you. So, not now. <laughs> so is this a signature role for you, Iago? Well, I suppose, uh, in, in normal sense of that, that phrase, yes. An interesting thing, or maybe not so interesting, being mean, being tough, are tricks. It's easy to be mean. <laughs> That's a trick. I think Jack Nicholson would probably say yeah. the same thing, you know, and we think of him as totally nuts in, in various movies. It's much harder to be a good guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to look into your guts to be a good guy. Rodrigo in mm -hmm. Don Carlo, mm -hmm. Gerard Chenier in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, good guys are harder. Simone, harder to be a good guy. Mean, you ripple the cheek muscles, you grit your teeth, <laughs> you bug your eyes a little bit. In a way, in a way, those are tricks. Obviously, I am saying you've got to have the throat to be able to do that, of course. Now, before we go into the next excerpt, there's a story that I've heard you tell about you singing Iago to Mr. Vickers Otello and the intensity of it. Uh, why don't you tell us about that? Well, John, who we still have with us, but not in such good shape, I think yeah. we're going to lose John in the next whatever piece of time. Before Placido, he was the Otello of the world, clearly an icon of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. So when somebody's that famous, you can say something a little bit uh, <laughs> not derogatory mm -hmm. necessarily. With John, 
when he was in a character, there was nobody minding the store. <laughs> <laughs> All mezzos, whether it's Delilah, whether it's Carmen, or a couple of other like that, will, will attest to the fact that when he would grab them, I mean, he would hurt. Well, a couple of times, it was Paris in particular. We did a long new production and a lot of rehearsal. He would grab my chest and get the hair. <laughs> well, guys, you know, if you got hair in your chest, that hurts. It's not serious, but John, John, you got the hair, hair, hair. <laughs> Let me just throw in James McCracken, Jimmy McCracken, was also a great Othello, not as famous as John became or not as famous as Placido, clearly. But Jim could inhabit the character the same way, except when you went up to Jim, he went, <laughs> he winked, and you knew somebody was minding the store. <laughs> With John, you didn't get any wink. He, he was somewhere else. Anyway. Oh, that is so funny. <laughs> now, um, we all enjoy the Kennedy Center honors and have since 1978. Uh, but I didn't know until this interview that you're actually a voter in uh, who gets the Kennedy Center. One of, one of those myriad of voters. I'm not sure how much uh, clout we have, but nevertheless, Yes, we do vote. If anyone has clout, I'm sure you do. Uh, we're going to look at an excerpt that is related to the Kennedy Center honor. So let's let's go to okay. our next clip. A little change of pace. <laughs> now, there's a story there. Yeah. Well, that was that was very cute. But you heard all the opera themes in there with changed words, and I had received the music, oh, a few weeks before and because I knew all of those things in, in the other languages. I was really working hard to dump out the French or the Italian and put in the English words because they're very clever. And I, I had worked hard on it and had it pretty close. However, still, she came in and she, Carol Burnett, carries a much bigger stick than I do. She walked in the first rehearsal and said, I want cue cards. I want big letters, and I want them now. <laughs> and I said, thank you. <laughs> so funny. You didn't see us actually look at the, the cue cards. I think we did it very well. But it saved your life, because you, know, you, get, you get one word, and boom, then you can go for a while, but you need the next word, that kind of stuff. It saved. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> that's, that's terrific. Now, the. The next clip has a particular personal uh, poignance because you are married to an extraordinary woman who is your partner in the voice experience in the programs in Savannah and around the country, yes, indeed. Maria Zubis. So let's take a look at this. That's a, that's a, a, a very nice pickup trick that you learn a, a song with the, the name of the woman you want to marry. Um, I was in the theater for that and the sound condensation on this doesn't capture what it what it was like it was an extraordinary evening it was it was lovely and julius riddell was conducting all, all, the whole evening dear julius for whom there's a concert in, yeah, in, or a memorial, memorial service in a few weeks yeah and you obviously feel comfortable going back between between opera and musical theater you uh were very flexible in the styles that you could perform well i suppose that's true i was brought up uh, dance band, bass player, before rock and roll, you know, the businessman's bounce, as we tended to, <laughs> tended to call it, uh, and crooned a lot. The older Broadway things, and certainly mm -hmm. West Side Story does fall into that, uh, a little different. In fact, in, in the Broadway world, they, they now tend to call it the classical Broadway and the more poppy. And it's different because Alfred Drake and, uh, well, well, Howard Keel, John Raitt, you know, these, mm -hmm. these were voices in their time. And they didn't have microphones, as I love to say, on their tonsils. <laughs> <laughs> they, had, they had enough juice to send sound out. There were many others like that. Did they ever try to lure you onto Broadway for a role on Broadway? Certainly there were other opera singers who uh, really made it on Broadway. Did they ever try to get you there? Mildly so. I never did summer stock, however, because I always had work. Mm -hmm. You understand, and, and the singers in the audience will understand what I mean. I was always working on Goldovsky pictures that they may see or saw already, 
uh, always working on something else, so I really didn't have the time. Mm -hmm. Although I would have done it in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. I'm an American, brought up with all the genres of music, and certainly Rodgers and Hammerstein and, and Lerner and Lowe and many of these earlier composers wrote hefty stuff. Now, you had a lot of friendship with people in showbiz, and this next excerpt is an example of some of the uh, friends from the showbiz industry that you used to enjoy and uh, who loved your performances. Let's look at it. Okay. What was, what was the setting for that one? Well, that was the, the tag end of a Love, Sydney was the last uh, series, comedy series that, that Tony did on television called Love, Sydney. And I, in this, uh, in this TV thing, was a bass player in a jazz band and, and sang some pop stuff and uh, invited me to sing at the daughter's birthday party. Mm -hmm. Well, then I sang the prologue in English. I, I translated it, you know, Prologue Pagliacci, translated it so it fit kids. In fact, my son, who's sitting right over there, was one of those. You didn't see him in this clip. Wow. <laughs> but you were there, remember, Sean? At any rate, I did the prologue. And then we had this little repartee thing. Tony and I did that little duet a lot of places. Ironically, that was the best rhythmic version, if you could if you can talk about excellence in, in pop things, it's a little different uh, dynamic, but that, that was the that best, was the best we ever sung ever. it. That's very funny. I'm glad it was <laughs> so I was lucky because it's here. Now, before we look at our last excerpt and then continue our conversation, uh, a question that I had later on um, in the talk, I want to I get to it before we get to this last excerpt. It's going to be with Placido. And of course, you are so associated with him in terms of all the repertoire you did. Um, I wanted to ask about colleagues. What makes a great colleague in opera? Well, if you asked various singers, you'd probably get different answers. I like counting. That is, <laughs> together. Mm -hmm. that's, what I, that's what I tell singers that work with us. Mm -hmm. Conductors want, first of all, together. Mm -hmm. Great high notes, great. But they may be with the second oboe, the second clarinet during your high note. Mm -hmm. They like together. Uh, so a great colleague is someone where the, the rhythms, you make music out of it, you make humanity out of it, but the rhythms are accurate. And then I suppose most of these mythical singers that you would ask this question of would say contact, action and reaction in the eyes. I'm old enough so that you, you mentioned that earlier, that mm -hmm. I sang with the older generation of singers. At that time, I think, I don't know that they were actually taught that drama was nothing, but it was never encouraged. Mm -hmm. Very, mm -hmm. very different now. Mm -hmm. Very different now. I mean, back then, one of my, one of my standard jokes is, oh, you want acting? <laughs> oh, more. More, okay. <laughs> well, that, that's a little bit silly, but nevertheless, there was that sense. And a few of them inhabited the carriages a little bit more, but in terms of working with their body and being comfortable in their own body, it was not exactly discouraged, but it certainly was not encouraged. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now times have changed greatly, and you want somebody right. in the eyes who knows what you're saying, and of course that means you have to know what they're saying as well, and you get a reaction, especially in the later operas. Mozart, early Verdi, a little more stylized. You don't have to be quite so much in the action, but Puccini, mm -hmm. and afterwards, oh, you had to be. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You're saying something, you want eye contact, you want electricity going on, and not just vague, musical lines, even if they're beautiful. That's not enough now. They mm -hmm. need to be beautiful, of course. But you have to invest in the character much more in these years. I think in this excerpt we're going to see, we will see uh, a great colleague uh, relating to you in a fabulous excerpt. So let's take a look at it. OK. Well, you were together. 
that was just really our electricity has always been pretty good. Oh, it, it, pretty good. And, and it must some of that's Verdi's fault. <laughs> we, we, we must not discount Verdi. It's Shakespeare's Verdi. It, it must be very gratifying to develop a partnership with another artist that lasts for decades, where you know one another artistically and personally and how you behave on stage. It must be a great sense of comfort. Oh, absolutely. Knowing that there's counting that I talked about <laughs> before, and making music, and with Placido. I mean, we're not here necessarily to just talk about Placido, but I'm happy to. <laughs> Lots of people do. Uh, and you say, let's hold it two bars. You got it. Let's hold it four bars. You got it. Mm -hmm. Let's hold it one bar. You know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, we were, Leontine and Placido and I were the RCA team for, I don't know, 15 or 20 years worth doing tons of recordings. In 1976, I drove from college after classes to get to a Met performance of Forza with you, Leontine, and Placido. There were two performances of that cast that season. Uh, and I will never forget it. I will absolutely never forget it. But I, what happened to you? Because it, when we look at your educational history, I mean, you started as a pre-med, and then you got a degree in music education. Uh, here you were not thinking about being a singer into your early mid-20s, and at the age of 30, you're making a debut as a Metropolitan Opera star baritone, and you're never looking back. So something happened in the middle of your 20s. Um, what, what was it? What was it? Well, there was, no, there was no one thing, obviously. First of all, we have to back up, because I'd always thought about being a singer. Did I know what an opera career was or singing at the Met? And I heard the broadcasts on Saturday afternoon and would listen to Delmonico Warren and Richard Tucker, you know, with whom, of course, I sang many times. I would hear these people. I was not the dreamer type. That is, I would hear a broadcast and think, mark my words, someday I'm going to be there. I wasn't, I wasn't that type. Uh, I was better at the small steps. Well, in, in, in a mistake that people make in aspiring to some career, whatever it is, not just necessarily just singing, they dream, and it's great to dream, but if you only dream, it's not going to happen because it's always two blocks away, and in five years, it's still two blocks away, and in 10 years, it's two blocks away, rather than the small steps. And I think before they saw some pictures of Goldovsky, Boris Goldovsky, with whom early years I sang, oh, hundreds of performances, uh, probably maybe even 300 performances mm. of 12 different roles many, many times, 40 and 50 traviatas, regolettos, barbers, uh, Giovanni's, after college, After college? Oh, after college. Okay. Oh, yes. This was so in early 20s. career. Mm -hmm. And before City Opera, which, mm -hmm. is, as you probably know, I debuted at City Opera when it was at the Masonic Temple the year before I debuted at the Met. Mm -hmm. I didn't know, of course, I knew that Leonard Warren had died, but you know, a farm boy from Illinois, which I am, I didn't know the Met, how the Met was trying to replace him, bringing over, as, as I now know in hindsight, Italian baritones trying to fill that void. Robert Merrill was still doing his stuff. Cornell McNeil was still doing his stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they needed, you need many voice categories to operate a house like the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, I didn't know they were still looking for a replacement. The fact is, I auditioned for the Met in the Fox Theater in Atlanta. Mm, the big Fox Theater. The big Fox Theater, because yeah. the Met used to tour right. there all the time before there was the no longer new right. uh, art center where there's another auditorium. And I remember walking out in the middle of a Samson and Delilah set. <laughs> Richard Boytock was playing piano. They just rolled out an upright. And I sang, I think, Faust, Avant de quitter ce lieu, and Eddie Du. And uh, yeah, right, pounding and nervous and all of, the, all of the normal audition situations. People ask me about you know, nerves. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're going to be nervous. Thank you. If you can't sing nervous, 
You know, forget about singing. You gotta be able to sing nervous. At any rate, then Mr. Bing, who was a boss, as well, anybody older knows who Mr. Bing was. I think you saw a picture of him with my mother mm -hmm. earlier on. Um, said, oh, uh, Mr. Mills, would you come down and sit with us, please? We would like to have you on the roster. Well, I was thrilled, of course. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, went to management and, and all of that. I was with Herbert Barrett, with whom I still am. There's two representatives of the Barrett management, has a different name now. Uh, and that was spring of 65 and debuted then in December of 65. And I feel very lucky, privileged. I spent one year in the old house, sang 18 performances in the old Met. So, you know, my phrase is the no longer new Met mm -hmm. at Lincoln Center, mm -hmm. which, you know, anybody younger, of course, it's the Met, right. as we know. Right. But I think of it, it's, it's the no longer new Met. How wonderful. At any rate, how, how wonderful. That was, uh, that was a thrill for me. So I, I asked you earlier, and I'm curious to see what, question, what answer you've come up with. If there is one performance that you could replay for us in all of the performances that you did, if you could replay one performance right now, either because it was so good or so bad and you could fix it, <laughs> what performance would that be? <laughs> Well, I wouldn't talk about a bad one, would I? <laughs> oh, sure, you could. It's safe. It's safe. No yeah, but I, 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 I cancel those out. I have a very good memory. <laughs> selective, selective mm -hmm. memory. Um, oh, my gosh. There's a bunch. Maybe I named two. There was an early Ernani, the old production. Uh, it was Bergonzi. Many of you may be coming to the memorial service in a few weeks. Um, that, was, that was already new house. That would be one. I'd never sung a nanny. I, I, I simply knew the title, but I didn't know anything about the music. Then there was an Otello in Vienna in 90 or 91 at the Staatsoper, Placido. A Danish conductor. Um, and, and uh, the Italian uh, soprano, um, not singing anymore. Yeah. Beautiful. Freni? Ricciarelli. There you go. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> Katia was Katia Ricciarelli. Mm -hmm. And then the best of the Staatsoper, mm -hmm. you know, the Lodovico and the Cassio, so the best of their people, it was the end of that season. And Herr Dreser, I can't remember his first name, Dreser was the he, intendant. He didn't have a first name. Everyone just called him Dreza. Dreza. <laughs> he, he had three names. At any rate, he was also retiring, and he was quite much beloved. That performance was a hot performance, and it was an old production. You know, in, in the European system, many of you probably know this, if it's an old production, you get one or two rehearsals, boom, you're on. <laughs> you bring a full toolbox of stuff. <laughs> vocal stuff, of course, vocal stuff, but staging stuff. You're shown pictures. Do you have a dress rehearsal? Of course not. <laughs> you, have, you have to produce. Well, that, that's tough, but you know, a lot of us did it. At any rate, it was a very hot performance. Good. We probably sweat as well, but that's not what I mean. And it was Drazer's retirement, and it was the last performance of the season, 1991. And as, as I've often said, Placido and my electricity, mm. I like to call it 240 instead of 120. <laughs> it, it was good. Well, Bows. Placido said he had this once with a Bohemian in Belton or something. I'd never had anything like this. There was an, an hour 45, one hour and 45 minutes of applause. <laughs> there was 101 Curtain calls. <laughs> I'm being literal. I'm not just saying, gee, it was a lot. No, it was 101. I'm, can you imagine that? I'd never, you know, our smile muscles got tired. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, sounds stupid to say that. Right. But our smile muscles got tired. For, at some point, they brought down the, the, the uh, foyer, curtain. The, the iron curtain, and we walked out in front of it because there were still, not everybody in the audience, you know, people slowly were leaving, but there was still a crowd, 101. Aye. That was exciting. 
I would like to see just how good it really was, because yeah, yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. You know, I did it. On. And it's odd, you know, I say I did it, I don't know how it was. When you're doing it, you know if you're kind of failing, if you've got vocal difficulties or cracking or something. Of course you know that. But you don't know that area from very good to super. When you're doing it, you don't always know the audience's reaction, even with the applause at the end. Obviously, that had to have been a pretty hot one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know, how many performances? I did 652 at the Met, mm -hmm. and then probably equal number in the rest of the theaters. That this is kind of a generalization. Mm -hmm. In the rest of the theaters of the world, that's a lot of operas, mm -hmm. a lot of applause. <laughs> Hence your, your early question, do you ever get tired of applause? Are you <laughs> kidding? <laughs> <laughs> so now you're turning your attention and sharing your wisdom with the next generation. Uh, I, I, what, what about teaching young singers is rewarding to you and what's challenging to you? Well, it, it, I find it very rewarding and I don't know if, if there's DNA for teaching. Uh, my mother was a piano teacher, church choir director, and I always thought about teaching. In fact, you mentioned I had a degree, both degrees, bachelor's of music education and master's of music education. I studied in order to teach, not, gee, in case I don't have a career, I can always teach. No, no, I studied to teach and played instruments and violin and clarinet and all, all of this stuff so that I could, on a public school level or university level, do band, orchestra, or choir, any of them or all of them. I knew enough representative instruments in all of those organizations. Um, and then, this farm I mentioned earlier was near Chicago. It was outside a suburb of Chicago. It wasn't really farmland. I think my brother and I and maybe one other family were the only farm kids in the high school. It was suburbia, down in Grove, Illinois, outside of Chicago. And I did everything there was to do around Chicago. Uh, I had a synagogue job, I had a Protestant job, and then I would, if I say a ringer, you know what I mean by a ringer, Choir directors found out if, if, if I didn't know it already, I could sight read it. I was a good sight reader, all mm -hmm. of that stuff. So I, I was working around Chicago all the time and doing every professional thing that there was to do in Chicago. And I found, well, each year I was a little better than the year before. And again, I'm better than the year before, I'm better than the year before, I'm better than the year before. At some point, the opera man at Northwestern at that point had been an associate of Boris Goldovsky's and said, you know, you should audition for Mr. Goldovsky. The closest he's going to be to Chicago is Cleveland Institute in Cleveland, Institute of Music. And I thought long and hard about that because I wasn't making very much money and I had to buy the, the trip to the flight to Cleveland, all of that stuff. I did it. I sang for Boris. And he said something about a place called Tanglewood. <laughs> well, I was Chicago. I knew Ravinia. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what Tanglewood was. But I was smart enough to not let him know that I didn't know. So you, you Googled it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. In the 60s, that, that, that word didn't exist in the 60s, right? And it was even late 50s, whatever. But I also got a sense of, well, Boston Symphony, Summer Home, how bad can it be? You know, if it's anything like Ravinia. So I went, spent two summers at Tanglewood, 1661, and that's when he hired me for Mazzetto, and I saw, okay, well, well, hey, hey, things are happening, step by step. And something maybe in an earlier question, you know, what happened in there mm -hmm. between that, what was I, 20, to three, four, five, somewhere in there, and that five years. Often it's been said, you know, some singers, if they skip a step of, of performance level, they, they pay for it later on. Well, I've often said, I did all the steps. I did them fast, but I did all the steps. There was a competition way back, 63, the Ford Foundation, did a competition. I was 
they didn't pick one winner. That was very smart. I'm, I'm sorry that they didn't continue this. They picked in every voice category mm. two or three singers. And the prize was not money they gave you in your hand, but the prize was these what, 15 or so singers. I was one of the baritones. Your fee was paid for any of the regional companies in the US, excluding the big four. You call them City Opera, Met, Chicago, San Francisco, excluding the big four. Mm -hmm. So Miami and San Francisco, uh, uh, Cincinnati and San Antonio and so forth, so forth, all, all these places. Well, that was a huge thing because the local auspices got the singer for free. Right. That was a great prize money because we, we had nothing in our bank account, but we worked for it and then we're paid. It's a really great concept. It was a great concept. I'm sorry that it didn't keep going. I'm not sure. I, I know nothing about the mechanics of that, why it didn't work. That kicked me into another level, although I was still with Goldovsky doing all kinds of leading parts. And the spring of 65, I was doing Giovanni with him. And then that December of 65, debuted at the Met. I don't know how many people have gone from Goldovsky to the Met, but there you are. I was one. And do you find that young singers today are receptive to this kind of narrative? Do they learn lessons? Do they absorb what you hope they absorb from it? Well, I think the general answer is yes. That obviously depends on their own psyche and you know, where they are emotionally, whatnot. Um, I'm old enough so that I bring history from the old guys. Now, I didn't go back to all the K's, mm -hmm. Klimper and, mm -hmm. and uh, Kempen, and the, I call them the K's, but Leinstorff, Schulte, Karian, Berm, Benstein, you know, these giants, giants. You know, I sang with all of them and got to know several of them very well. Mr. Berm is the one who took me to Vienna for my European debut and subsequently Salzburg, Giovanni, and so forth and so forth. So I think the, the, the specific answer is yes, they listen because they have that much sense of history mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that I bring that. Do you talk to them about vocal technique or is it all interpretation? Is it uh, theatrical representation of the role? What, what, what do you like teaching the most? Well, it, all of the above is one of the test answers. All of the above. <laughs> I listen to somebody sing in a master class situation, and I think, what can I give them that will make them better now? Sometimes it's language, sometimes it's involvement, eyes. Eyes are huge. If your eyes aren't involved, you know, sometimes we will hear a singer and we like the voice, but they look like they're out to lunch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nothing going on. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, forget that. That's terrible. Even if you're faking it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Even if you're faking it, fake it. Mm -hmm. I tell singers all the time, doing something is always better than doing nothing. Even if you change your mind down the road and decide that something you're doing isn't quite the right thing, it's always better than doing nothing. Nothing is the worst choice. Uh, where were we going with this? I'm forgetting. <laughs> so you, you, I do rattle on. I'm sorry. No, no, no. But, but you will talk to them about vocal technique as well, not languages, vocal language, technique. Language, body energy, sometimes low support, mm -hmm. tension, too much tongue wiggle or jaw wiggle, mm -hmm. uh, eye blinking. Some people will sing a high note. And you, <laughs> you see this. Well, that's very disconcerting. <laughs> Partly, they don't know they're doing it. That's the first thing. T to identify a problem, you have to identify it, then maybe they can work on it. But so it, it, I judge that individually. And if, if somebody is young, for instance, uh, is a college situation, they're doing an Italian art song, and they're 18, 19, 20, well, there are certain things you cannot expect from them. There's a musical sophistication that is simply not there. I was on the faculty at Northwestern for seven years. The first year I had some freshmen and whatnot, and I realized you know, it's kind of a waste because there's stuff that I could give them, but they, 
they can't take it. So then talking to the dean, who was a good friend and still is, uh, moved to seniors and grads mm -hmm, only. Mm -hmm. Then if somebody's 23, 24, there's just you have something to work with. lots of stuff you can do differently. Can you go to an opera performance and just enjoy it? Or are you always engaged in assessing it, in reliving it? <laughs> You said those questions were going to be easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, something that I, I say to singers, the more you know about something, in general, it's great. But there's a downside. You go to performance, and if you know about a cello, or a flute, or a tenor, or a baritone, whatever, you're going to listen with judgment, of course. And if they're terrific, you're going to enjoy it much more than the average audience. But if they're not, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you'll enjoy it much less mm -hmm, mm -hmm. than the average audience. It, there's a downside, but I always tell them, go to a performance, learn. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll learn what not to do. But more often you'll learn what to do. Absolutely. What to do. We only have a few more minutes left, so I wanted to bring the house lights up a little bit so I can see people's hands. And others in the room may have questions for Mr. Mills, and I'd love to hear them. Laura Lee Everett has a microphone and is ready to run around. I am. Are and they going to bring the lights actually, up? Because it, it, we, uh, we also, need to applaud this gentleman who Saturday, <laughs> it's his 25th anniversary. This Saturday, oh, Mark Sparka. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. This is about you. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. This is about you. Are there are there questions? Questions for Cheryl. One right over here is uh, uh, literally there's one right and there. And I have I have one that's a streaming audience actually. And this we're, the reason we have the microphone is because we're doing a live stream, and this is a way to get it on the live stream. Uh, the, the, the streaming question that came in was, what is the most useful advice, career and or life? anyone has ever given you? Oh, give it me. Oh, my. And who gave it to you? I was a good sponge. I mean, lots of things that Boris Goldovsky told me, I, I converted it into bigger leagues because he didn't work with the, the guns of the world, the famosi of the world. Some of us became that. Uh, I thought you were going to ask me what advice I would give. That's an easier question. <laughs> Which is sing anywhere and everywhere you can. Yeah. <laughs> sing anywhere and everywhere you can. Your best shot every time. Careers are made by your best shot every time. A little different than the pop field where you know a hit record can elevate somebody. We don't really have that phenomenon. Mm -hmm. You got to do it every performance, a hundred, two hundred, a thousand, every one. Your best shot. Not all are going to be. You know, we're human, so levels vary. Mm -hmm. Of course. There's a question up here, and instead of getting the microphone yeah. there, if you say it, I'll restate it for the live stream. Okay. Um, this is a hard one because you told me before. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's hard, but um, Americans enjoyed the great succession of very baritones from Lawrence mm -hmm. Tibbet, Richard mm -hmm. Benelli. Leonard Warren, Robert Merrill, and Cheryl Mills. But who has replaced Cheryl Mills? And my question is, if somebody hasn't, why has there not been another great American very Barrett? For the live stream, the question is about the wonderful decades-long tradition of great American baritones from Lawrence Tibbet through Cheryl through many other people. Right. And we don't seem to have that great American Verdi baritone today. Uh, is it teaching? Is it is it, is it about uh, teaching? Yeah. Is it about aesthetics? Well, yeah, well, let's, why don't we? let's not forget Cornell McNeil Absolutely. Right. In, in, in that line. Yep. Right. And you added Bonelli, who a name most do not know. Right. He was outgunned by Bob N. and Leonard Warren. Um, well, there is no exact answer. First of all, Verdi baritone, the American Verdi baritone, to a certain degree, is determined by the public by the public perception. And I'm very grateful and, and happy that the perception is uh, you know, uh, continuing that line. Why exactly? Boop. I don't know. 
um, I think probably the best, he's not American, the best baritone, although I've not heard him recently, but uh, is Dmitry Hodostovsky. Mm -hmm. That's, that's mm -hmm. great voice. May I help answer this question? Uh, <laughs> our, our vocal authority in the front row, Jane Robinson, is going to opine about the state. Opine is a good verb. Uh, uh, <laughs> totally. Um, as I was a standee at the Old Met. I saw you do more than 50 performances, both there and at the Metropolitan Opera. And nobody, Cheryl, nobody had your sense of timing. And I've watched you teach. And what I observe is someone who is such an incredible musician, and you have the incredible ability to show these people what it's all about but they don't have your timing, and you can't teach that. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Well, thank you, indeed. Um, timing. Other questions? Yes, right here, Jane, Jane, Jane Gross, the, oh. in the Jane section. In the Jane I, section, sorry. <laughs> I can be loud enough. I often get to meet these days some very young singers who are just heading into college and there's a limited amount of repertoire they can sing and a limited amount that they can do. They're too young for the standard young artist programs. And they say, what should I do? What I've been saying is spend as much time as you can really learning languages and go take some acting classes and add all of that into your future. Spend a summer in Europe, in Italy, studying Italian, one studying Russian, one studying French, one studying German, and Get all of that nailed in before you go. It is, am I oh, doing the right thing that. by these children? We like you know, the time of each day. You have 24 hours, and you can't work 24 hours. You have to sleep and rest. All of that stuff. Plus, sing art songs. Sing songs where the keys, that one of the problems with opera for youngsters is that most of opera is the NFL. Mm -hmm. Most of opera is the NFL. There's a few exceptions, but by and large, you know, the, the bombers. Well, it, the age you were talking about, of course. So, sing art songs in keys where you're not worried about the high note at the end. <laughs> and you learn to invest in the character, to invest in the poetry, and grow your voice, higher, lower, mm -hmm. diminuendi, crescendi, control, and acting, er everything you said, plus art songs. I think. Some people who study opera tend to think, well, I'm only going to sing opera, lead or French melody. Eh. Wrong. Mm -hmm. Totally wrong. Mm -hmm. Totally wrong. One more question. Uh, yes. I have had I have heard G sharp, high A, B flat. want to have become a tenor? <laughs> <laughs> Am I tired of people thinking think I you, might be a tenor? Yes. Or become 70s, a tenor. I mean, there are always these articles about, you know, should Sharon Mills be a tenor? I remember those articles. Yeah. <laughs> there, yeah, various conductors say, are you sure you're not a tenor? Well, I, was I smart? I guess it may be in hindsight I was. I don't know. There's a difference between high notes and tessitura. This group understands exactly what those words mean. Huge difference. Mm -hmm. Warren could sing those notes, probably mm -hmm. higher than I could. They said he did the C in the party and KJ Le Damanina and all of that stuff. C's, I did B flats. I, I like to, you know, nudge the tenors in the behind. The, <laughs> <laughs> Although, you know, I sang the A mm -hmm. at the end of the duet. Mm -hmm. Those of you who know about keys and notes, that's probably all of you. Uh, I would always ask the Otello, whoever it was, do you mind if I sing the A with you at the end of the duet? <laughs> and they always said, please. <laughs> a little, please a little sing reinforcement. It. A little please re sing it. Vickers and, and the lot, they all said, please do it. Because Otello, as you know, he keeps going. He has tons more. Iago, vocally, not acting wise, but vocally, diminuendo. Right. Right. He has less to sing. Otello knows, and the, and the Otello knows, he's got lots, third and fourth act, is tons. So they always say, 
Sing me in if they crack, which they did all the time. Well, you didn't hear it because my A, well, I could blow the top of my head off. And <laughs> it was okay. Well, um, I think if you asked anyone in this room if you could sing an A, they would all say yes, and they'd give you an A. Uh, it is such an A for an A. Uh, it is such a privilege and a pleasure to have you in the Opera Center to speak with you about your incredible career. You are as good a storyteller as you are a teacher and baritone. Uh, Cheryl Mills, congratulations on your birthday. Congratulations for all the work you're doing with Maria through the voice experience and through Thank the you. Cheryl Mills uh, Foundation. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in saluting and in thanking Cheryl Mills.